Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we are going to be talking to Cal Newford and we are talking about his book, How to Become a Straight A Student. And what it includes is exactly as it claims, the unconventional strategies real college students use to score high while studying less. So welcome, Cal. Thanks, CJ. So um, I love how you actually constructed the book because, uh, and, and even the very beginning in the book, you talk about how a lot of studying techniques are by dinosaurs like myself who are writing in this academic sense about how to study. Tell us about the approach that you use when we're constructing this book. Yeah, it's ironic because I'm a professor today, but when I wrote that book 10 years ago, I had just graduated from college. And I remember looking out at the available books that were on the shelf for how to study, and a lot of them were written by professors long separated from their own undergraduate careers or other sort of self-proclaimed academic skills experts. And when you would look at the strategies that they were proposing in their books, they were completely unrealistic for the reality of what the typical sort of ambitious undergraduate lifestyle was. They would either be somewhat paternalistic and way too sort of childish for undergraduate level work, or they would be hopelessly time consuming. It just right. wouldn't, wouldn't make sense for the flow of work. So that was the starting premise of this book. Yeah. Let's actually find out how, how real students who do well study and get away from this idea of just thinking up abstractly what would be a good study system. Yeah, and what I love about the how you approached it is you just talked to students that did really well, not only really well academically, but just did really well generally. Like they had well-rounded lives where they actually, you know, did things aside from studying at school. And how many people did you an interview? Or how, like it sounds like you talked to other people that, from various universities that are mentioned in this book. Yeah, I ended up talking to 50 students more or less. But it's actually interesting. I, I never planned on writing that book. In fact, I ended up writing that book while I was still in the editing process for my first book. And, and the reason that happened was I, I stumbled into the concept because I was uh, an early inductee to the Phi Beta Kappa for my college, which was about the 30 highest GPAs. So the 30 students in my class of 1,000 with the, the highest GPAs out of the class of 1,000. So I went to the or I guess it was an initiation sort of reception. Right. Uh, so I could say, okay, now I'm going to see who are the other 29 students at this university that have the highest GPAs right. in my class. And I was struck by who they were because I, I knew a lot of these people and they weren't at all who you would expect <laughs> to be the people with the highest GPAs. Right. You thought it was going to be the, the super nerd type, the, 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 the pre-med that's in the, the library on Friday night instead of going out. And I knew these guys from fraternities. I knew these guys from like, some of the campus magazines I wrote for. These weren't people who were particularly stressed out. They were social people. Uh, and they didn't match the stereotype. And so I surveyed them. So well, tell me about your study habits. Like, I got the email list. I sent them a survey. You know, I was a budding writer at the time. And I was yeah. looking at their study habits, and they had a lot in common with each other. They had a lot in common with me. And there was a lot that was quite a bit different from what I saw other students doing. And that's where I had this insight that, you know what, the very top students on campus are not who you think they are. Because of their good study habits, they're not the stressed out all-nighter working 12 hours, 15 hours a day type students. They're actually working way less than the students right below them on the GPA scale. <laughs> so when I discovered that, I said, oh, no, I think I'm going to have to write another book. <laughs> and so I went out there and expanded the search, of course, beyond just my university and, and right. to talk to students from, from across the country. And what was the first book that you were writing that you said you were midway through? It was called How to Win at College. Oh, and okay. the concept there was I just talked to uh, national, international award winners, so like Rhodes Scholars and Truman yeah. Scholars. And it was a, a simple format book. It was just advice. So I just interviewed a bunch of these very successful students and just, you know, what's your advice you would give to a freshman? And it was a bunch of short little rules. And it touched some on studying, but it really covered all different aspects of student life. And so it wasn't until this book that I really got deep into the specifics of actually doing the academic work at college successfully. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, what I like about this book is it's very specific. It's very concrete. It's not, you know, a lot of books that you see of this kind of category provide generalisms, but they don't give... And what this book has is like specifics, two days before the exam, start doing this, you know, three days, <laughs> which is only what you can do is if you actually have been doing that in college, right, which is why I think this book is so powerful. And it's, you know, it's 10 years old, but it's still, I think, relevant. Like I could look at this and say, yeah, the, you know, maybe you have to do some slightly different things, but I, I kind of doubt it because you were during the time of the Internet 
you know, flow of, you know, the, this absorption of tons and tons of information from different resources. I mean, this was happening 10 years ago, too, which is what's happening right now. Yeah, it was just starting to happen. I think the main difference technologically between when I wrote that book and now was uh, cell phones weren't really a thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I don't, I don't get into this book as much as I probably would have to today about avoiding distraction because we didn't have Facebook on a smartphone back then. Right. But everything else is pretty much, you know, yeah. it is, there hasn't been a lot of massive changes in what it means to, to go to a classroom, hear a lecture, take notes, study, and take right. a test. That looks pretty much the same that it did today, that it did 10 years ago, that it did 50 years ago. Yeah, and you can say that because now you're a professor, too. So you're like, oh, you know, I get it. And when you now that when you look at it from a professor's standpoint and you think, oh, yeah, actually, this makes sense. Because in some ways, this is, I think what the book does is it kind of assumes like, okay, if you're a professor, what are you trying to to do you're trying to test knowledge you're trying to answer questions you're i mean does it make sense now from the professor standpoint that you stand from right now yeah i would definitely advise my students to follow my advice from 10 <laughs> years ago because it it is basically you know how do i make sure that i understand the material and i think crucially and this is what was missing in a lot of the older books how do i do that with a sort of ruthless efficiency because otherwise it just doesn't work the the workload at college is manageable if you're ruthlessly efficient with your habits. And I think this was the disconnect is that when you get separated from the workload at college far enough and you're thinking in the abstract, you come up with, well, this would be a great way to study if you just had one thing to study and all the time in the world. And that's where you get things like the Cornell note-taking method or, or these 10, 15-step study processes, which when you test them in the laboratory, you do great. Uh, it's a, it, it very comprehensively covers the right. material, but it takes ten times more time than, than right. the average. Right, you're taking five, four have. to five different classes, right? So, like, yeah. how are you going to do that? Multiply by four to five. It's not practical. And um, what I thought actually, and I was thinking philosophically about this, and I thought, okay, what is the interesting frame to put this in? And uh, have you ever heard of James Cars, who wrote the book of Finite and Infinite Games? No. Okay, that sounds okay. interesting. Okay, so here's what, and I thought, okay, how do I exp explain this succinctly? And here's what he said. Finite games are the familiar contest of everyday life. They're played in order to be won, which is when they end, right? Like, you know, if I play a match of tennis, it's over. I have these points, that's done. But infinite games are more mysterious. Their object is not winning, but ensuring the continuation of play. The rules may change, the boundaries may change, even the participants may change, as long as a game is never allowed to come to an end. So what are infinite games? How do they affect the ways we play our finite games? And what are we doing when we play finitely or infinitely? And how can, we, how can infinite games affect the ways in which we live our lives? And uh, I thought about this as I was reading this book, because really what, you know, Becoming a straight A student is a finite game, right? It's a this sure. is how I think of it, which is be becoming an A student is a finite game in which you're trying to win so that you can win in the societal definition of winning. Yes, right. But as you adeptly say in your book, you say brute force study habits are incredibly efficient and it's possible to come up with techniques that work much better and require much less time. That's like how do you be really efficient and smart about the game? But studying, learning doesn't have to become draining or something you fear. With a little experimentation, academics can be satisfying and fulfilling. That's ultimately the infinite game, right? Yeah. Like what we're trying to do, you, and, and this is so beautifully said in the last part of your book, you said grades open the door to many interesting and competitive opportunities that allow you to make a decision on what would bring you fulfillment. This book is about grades, but it's really about taking responsibility for your own journey through life, which to me is the infinite game. I don't. Yeah. Is that is that frame helpful? I don't even know if this is what you're thinking when you're writing a book or not. Yeah. Is that is that frame helpful for you? I think that I think that is a helpful frame. I, it's easy just to focus on the finite aspects of the grades, and, and you know, really, the point I was trying to make is that there's there's two elements to it. Uh, the better your grades, it, it is just the more control or autonomy you gain over what you do after college. So you, you put aside commentary or subjective evaluation on grades as a useful system or an effective system and think of it instead as this is the capital that you have to invest in your own life and career. Mm -hmm. So the better grades you have, the more options you have for doing things, the more interesting things you can pursue or not pursue. It's not that these things 
all interesting things all require good grades. But the better the grades you have, just the more control and options you have to start crafting a life in an interesting way. Yeah. And the other point I always emphasize is that though there are issues with grading as a way of evaluation, pushing those things aside, you know, all things being equal, the better you score in a class, for the most part, the better you understand that material. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we, we get away from that a lot when, with uh, absolutely true but somewhat tangential rhetoric about there's more to intelligence than grades, there's something conformist about trying to get good grades. There's these, there's these commentaries which all have truth to them, but I can say from being on both ends of the classroom as the student and the professor, for the most part, the student who got an A in the class really understands that material better than the student who got a C in the class. And yes, there are things that can matter, that can adjust your grade that are somewhat subjective, but for the most part, to say, I'm going to try to get a straight A in this class is also the same as declaring, I'm going to try to actually learn this material pretty well. As long as I'm here, as long as I'm taking yeah. this class, paying for the credit hours, I want to come away knowing it as, as sort of best I can. So it's, it's actually, I think, a, a worthy goal just from uh, an intellectual development right. perspective as well. You know, I've also, I've had um, arguments because my son said, I could actually do the work to get an I, I, the the amount of work that it takes for me to get an A minus or A is just it's so like the amount of work to get there is a lot more work to get an A minus versus an A. So and I know that I can get an A minus and still have a balanced life. So why should I really go for the A? Because the incremental work is so much, so much, so much more. And uh, I talked to this is in middle school because he was yep. challenging the whole thing with grades and. Yep. Um, and the the middle school uh, head of the school said, because you just want to prove to yourself that you can get it, that you can do the very, so that you can at least prove and know that you can get it versus using the excuse that I don't want to get it to know that you can get it. And yeah. I thought that was an interesting point because I think a, a, the controversy with a book like this is that like, well, it's not that grades matter. It's, you know, it's all these kind of, you go into a flurry of all these kind of like naysayers, but when you look at it from the finite and infinite game perspective, you go, well, yeah, ultimately, what, it's not that you're trying to get a straight A. It's because you're trying to have options and opportunities. And so yeah. from that vein, what I wanted to talk about is so part one of your book talks about um, the importance of planning. And uh, I'm a big time planner, so I completely get it. And as much of a planner as I am. I, I actually like to go back and do some of these techniques myself, myself. <laughs> and I'm a life coach, you know, Matt, you know, in addition. So it's kind of the whole thing is kind of funny because you have to practice what you preach. Um, but in part one of your book, you have this cheat sheet. So every um, what I love about this book is it's for the ultimate in efficiency, right? Like I read the chapters before and then I have a cheat sheet. <laughs> so if I don't yep. remember it, I have like exactly. I can skim it down. So um, and there's really simple things. And I think the main point that you make is when you plan, there's a whole bunch of stuff in, in college, especially a five, four to five different classes that you're taking, you're managing that with extracurricular activities. There's a whole bunch, and now there's a ton of information like a fire hose coming mm -hmm. into your inbox, texts, phones, all that kind of stuff. And it's draining of your energy. So keeping on task and focus with what am I supposed to do versus what I am doing, like checking Facebook and all this other <laughs> stuff. Yep. makes it really hard so these kind of techniques i think um they don't drain your energy because you're not thinking you're you have in one place all the things that you have to do so you're not having to kind of put it in your head which i think is becoming harder and harder with the amount of information out there so they keep you focused and then because you're focused you can fit more in which mm -hmm. which is what i think was a key point in your book is that you have more balance like you can do yep. more which makes you happier, right? You're not just studying in the library the whole time. Yeah, it's more, but with less time. Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, tell us a little bit. So, and, I, and and do you still use these as a professor? You had said that you know you basically take five minutes a day, you jot down your to dos and deadlines, and then you know every day, every morning, you're kind of looking at it and saying, okay, how am I going to manage my day? Do you still use something like that in your? I deadline? use I use more sophisticated evolutions. Okay. of that system. So this was sort of, uh, for me, I'm a big thinker on time management scheduling. Okay. This is the, the entry-level system. Okay. So I think it's, it's perfect for a college student who for the first time really has to be concerned about issues of capture and control yeah. with their time and schedule. Uh, this can then evolve to, to, to slightly more powerful versions as, as you move through life and responsibilities get even more numerous. But the same philosophies in that book 
capture and control uh, are absolutely at the foundation of, of how I still manage my time and obligations. Okay, so it's capturing all the different pieces and to-dos that you have yes. and then controlling them and organizing them in a reasonable fashion. Is that what that's you mean by That's right. So, so capture is everything that's on your plate. Every obligation is out of your head. Right. You, on nothing, a piece of paper. Or on someplace. a piece of paper in a system that is reviewed on a, on a regular basis. So nothing is being kept only in your head. Uh, your head can be completely clear of worrying about that. You know it's written down and it'll be looked at. And control is about actually controlling your time. So the absolute worst thing you can do from a productivity perspective is just kind of go through your day and say, well, what do I want to do next? What should I work on next? If you really want to get the most out of your time and, and save yourself a lot of grief, you have to have control over your hours. You need to look at the whole day ahead and make a plan for the hours of the day, not just a to-do list you're going to try to get through. A plan for the what am I going to do during these hours that I'm in class, actually seeing the day, what's free, what's not free, and then controlling your time on larger scales too. What does my week look like? What does my month look like? Right. So the plan in the book gives you a very simple way to get into capture and control. Yeah, and then and you can add complexity onto that as needed. Yeah, and I think the thing that I really love the most is just you provide a little, with each of these chapters, you provide a little example. And so in yeah. the example in the book, it said, you know, from 1230 to 1, I have like a segment of time open, which I will then now, you know, buy a gift for my dad, you know, do some research on something that I need to do, like, you know, to put the laundry in, you know, whatever it is. But it's, it's stuff that without kind of thinking through that five minute in the beginning of the day, I would have taken that half an hour and looked at Facebook, you know, done something yep. totally useless yep. and not productive at all. So I love that idea. And the only other things I wanted to touch on that I just thought were fantastic ideas, whether you're a student or an adult still works. And tell me before I go on to that, what are the tools that you use online tools that people could use today? Because before this, they probably didn't have the plethora of online tools. And like you said, you're now a master in this. Yeah. What are some tools that, um, you really think are fantastic at this whole capture and control. Yeah, well, I'm actually, so I'm a big proponent of simplicity with tools. The simplest tools often give you the most flexibility and, and have the least amount of friction. So I've never been a big advocate of custom-built tools for productivity or organizational systems for the most part because the more you actually are working with some sort of specialized system, the more energy it takes to make it do what you want to do and you're, you're more likely going to, to avoid it. So I do things very simple. Uh, my tasks right now, I keep them in just a big online document. I use a Google Doc so I can access it from different computers, mm -hmm. but I want to format it my own way. I want complete flexibility. I don't use a to-do software. It's just big long document because I can format it how I want. I still plan my day each morning with paper. Mm -hmm. So in, in, oh, interesting. in Straight A Student I talk about uh, ripping out a sheet of paper you can bring in your pocket and then the simple idea was you just had on one side your plan for the day and on the other side a place to capture stuff that showed up during the day so that the, uh, the next morning or what have you, um, you could take the stuff that you jotted down there and, and, and move them onto your calendar. Yeah, so you'd be a, a teacher would say, hey, and I'm going to have you know, a quiz on whatever, then you'd write it on the little piece of paper, or probably right now you'd put it on your Google phone task list or something, or you capture yeah. it someplace. Yeah, so, so that the idea is that when something comes up, you have the sheet, you always put it, and then every morning what you do is when you make your plan for that day, you look at the stuff you wrote down the day before and put it where it needs to go. And in the straight-A student system, you actually just put these tasks onto days of your calendar when you think you might do them. Right. Uh, in the system I do today, it, they would actually just go on a big list of obligations, and then I review that list of obligations with making my plan. But it's the same idea. Yeah. But anyways, I still use, I don't use a, a loose sheet of paper anymore. I have a notebook, but it's mm -hmm. the same idea. I have a spiral notebook every day. I have one side for my daily plan, the other side for capturing. So the, wow. the, the very same things that I said to use as a student, I still do today. It was just back when I was a student, I didn't know that I would always have a notebook with me. Right. So I figured yeah. a sheet of paper I can put in my pocket. And yeah. no matter where I go, I can have it. Now as a professor, I tend to be at my desk uh, more of the day, so I can yeah. actually and have do, and, and do you do that, you do use that offline tool, which I'm calling a notebook, <laughs> more <laughs> because it just is easier for you to write in it? Is that yeah. what you do versus putting it online? Yeah, for, it, it's uh, it's flexible. Paper is incredibly flexible. Uh, so you can do all sorts of things on paper. So I can start blocking out my day. Something shifts. Well, I can cross out these hours and draw an arrow over here and redo the blocks and then have a note about why I did it. I can have a little flow chart when I'm making my plan. Hey, make a decision here. Uh, if, if this looks like it's not going to get done in time, swap it with this block, move this block back over here. 
I can, I can capture things in different levels of detail. Paper is actually incredibly flexible in a way that when you're staring at, uh, you know, forms to type information into on some sort of online tool, it's not nearly as uh, flexible. Ah, yeah, okay, fair enough, and I get it. And it's fast, too. I mean, you can right. write fast. And, and then the other reason is I don't like distraction. And so I don't want to have to go online unless, you know, I have oh, a... Oh, that's reason. brilliant. So I don't want a, a system that requires me throughout the day to get out a computer and go online. I do a lot of work as a, as a theoretical computer scientist. I solve theorems for a living. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my work is on paper. A lot of my work is on a whiteboard or walking around and thinking. So yeah. I, I, I can go many, many hours, if not days, without touching a computer sometimes. Yeah. So it's important to me that I don't have systems that force me uh, to use a computer yeah. a bunch of times throughout the day. And I think that's true of anyone, whether you're a theoretical computer scientist or just an average, you know, CJ walking around, because the minute I go on, boom, I get a text message. Oh, I see that someone pinged me in Facebook, you know, and like all is lost, right? <laughs> all is lost. I've true. entered into a world of distraction because I have everything online. Okay, a couple of other things that I love in this idea. Um, uh, and, and this is so sad. When you reach my age, you may have to do this too. But I'm actually getting taking a class so I can add more fun back into my life. Because by the time you reach the age of 52, you're so structured and organized and getting stuff done that you forget to have fun. Yeah. And here's a great thing that you mentioned that's frankly in the book, in this class I'm taking about having fun and organizing your life around fun. It has these same ideas. And hmm, I think excellent. these are super critical. And um, one is transfer horrible tasks <laughs> um, so that you can it, it's basically taking the drudgery taking the drudgery out of work right so we think oh my god we have a midterm ah, or a quiz or whatever and then you spend all your time dreading the whole thing versus breaking it out into small segments and then yeah there are going to be days when when all this small segments line up you're going to have a really big hard day where things are stacked one after another it's going to be what's called a crappy day right yep. where, where you're going to have to do stuff and what's interesting is i think you say so plan it out you already know you're going to have a crappy day so have a light day a crappy day a light day and a crappy day you don't have to have four crappy days in a row if you plan this out you mm -hmm. know with some foresight um you don't have to have four crappy days you know to spread them out over a course of two weeks yeah. Is that, is that what you meant, or do you have any other additional? Yeah, it's, a, it's exactly what I meant. So when it comes to this notion of controlling your time, yeah. uh, I, this is one of the advantages you get. So this is why I say you, you plan out your day, what am I going to do with each hour, but also once a week you look at your your weekly calendar, what's coming up ahead, and you, and you make this plan. And, and in the book, I recommend doing this all on your calendar because it's an easy way to do it. But you can say, well, put on your calendar, I need to start working on this midterm studying this day and then this day I'm going to be really busy so I'm not going to get much done and then this right. day I'm going to do the problem set and return to the midterm so you're you're moving the pieces around like a chessboard mm -hmm. and once you have control over your time then you can decide you see everything that's due you can see that you have a lot of things coming up and you can choose okay this day I'm going to make a hard day I'm going to I'm going to get out of this meeting, I'm going to cancel this thing and it's going to be a really long day and then I'll have a breather this next day and then another hard day even if you're not changing the amount of hard work you do by a single minute, it, that is a much better experience because you have this sense of autonomy, mm -hmm. right? So, so a lot of what gets college students down about uh, really hard work piling up is this feeling that it's being imposed mm -hmm. on them from the outside, that it's mm -hmm. extrinsic, like, oh, mm -hmm. people are just putting this work on me. And that's a very hard motivational state to be in. But if you chose, no, Friday, Friday is going to be the day that's hard. From a motivational perspective, it, it's a much better scenario than just you realize that morning like, oh no, I'm just going to have to be working all day. It's the difference between feeling like you made the choice for a hard day and having a hard day imposed upon you. Right. And, and from the perspective of, of motivation and happiness and energy, there's a huge difference between those two, even if the amount of work is the same. Right. And I think also in the other nuance to it is that if you have a light day before, you're looking forward to that day. Yeah. And I think the thing that you said to add to that is the autonomy to, if a friend says, do you want to have lunch? You could say yes. I mean, the thing about having four consistent, you know, uh, unplanned week is that you're like, no, I can't. I got to yeah. go hit the books because, you know, I don't. But if you're like, yeah, it's a light day. Yeah, let's go grab lunch. You know, you have an example of where you're like, yeah, let's go to a Walmart run. I don't know why I love this, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> I don't know why that was such a big deal, but it was. <laughs> but it's true. You know, the big complaint people have when I talk about you need to control your time is they say, well, wait a second. You're going to structure all spontaneity. 
yeah. out of your day. But it's not at all the case. By, by actually having control of your time, you can have better relaxation and more spontaneity. For one thing, you know when you're working, you also know when you're not working. Mm -hmm. That means you can be completely relaxed because you have a plan, you're controlling your time, and you know that your day this particular day ends at this certain time and you can trust that you can stop working and really relax and that's a deeper relaxation than if you just sort of have swirling in your head I have a lot going on right. it also saves you from this mode of uh, well I just feel like there's a lot going on so I just need to be busy and I'll be guilty if I'm not working and you ah, get right. sort of uh, all day low grade low intensity work at all times a sort of uh, masochistic approach to I want to feel like I'm putting effort in I know I should be busy so I'm just going to deprive myself of relaxation if I'm yeah. just sort of always working this is where the parents always get the call back from the college freshmen it's always them trying to prove to the parent you don't understand how hard I'm working yeah. I'm not doing any fun if you control your time you don't have those issues because you have yeah. a plan you know how much work you need to do you know your schedule for doing work so if someone says let's go on a Walmart run you can just say great I can just take that hour and move it here no problem let's right. go have some because fun. Because you've planned on spontaneity and fun. Yeah. Because you, you, you hard bake that in your schedule right. Yeah Which because is you know when you're going to work so you can trust all the other time you can relax right. and it's completely fine to change the schedule around. I, I always make this point that the goal is not you win if your schedule is followed to the T. Right. That's not the goal. The goal is that you don't want there to ever be a point during your day where you don't have some intentionality in how you're going to spend your time. Right. So if something changes, something changes. Something takes longer, something comes up, that's fine. Next time you have a moment, step back and say, let me now adjust my plan for the rest of the day. What do I want to do with the rest of my time? Right. So the, the goal is not, hey, I my schedule never changed, I get a medal. The goal right. instead <laughs> is... Uh, I have some intentionality about how I want to spend my time. I actually thought about it and said, here's what I'd want to do with the rest of my day. And if you have to change that a dozen times, that doesn't matter. That's not bad. The key is you just don't let yourself get into a situation where you have no plan for your time going uh, forward. Okay, so like in the instance where your friend's like, let's go to Walmart, you're like, I got to do that. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> then, you got back, <laughs> then you got back and thought, okay, here's the here's now how, I have to, how the plan has to change. Yeah, and you shift the plan work. around. Yeah, yeah. Shift the plan got around. it. Yeah, so it's either the five minutes the day after or at that moment you're like, yeah, all right, I, I know I didn't have to do this Walmart, but I really had to. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, to. that's right. Each, okay. morning, each morning you make your plan for the day, but then you're probably going to adjust that several times. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if you have to, to plan for spontaneity. And I think actually the other thing that you mentioned, which I think is so critical and you miss, and especially when you start going in a corporate environment, which is where I grew up, you spend like hours at your desk just sitting there working and working. And actually, I was talking to someone at DreamWorks. I don't know if they still do this, but at DreamWorks, they have self-imposed breaks where after an hour, they're like, eh, like your computer just powers down. I love it. <laughs> and you have to like get up and walk around, like get a drink, you know, do something because they know that your creativity, absorption rate, and ability to be great at that moment is gone down because you've been sitting on your can for an hour, and that's yep. not good. Yep. Um, but I think that's another thing that I think we don't realize, and we think we're being, there's that martyr attitude, like, I've got through four hours of writing as paper, or somehow I'm morally yeah. superior. No, you're just inefficient. <laughs> yes, it's, it's true. Hour three and four are, are terrible hours. Yeah, it's just that, like... Yeah. <laughs> diminishing returns as you go there okay and then the only thing that um they say in the fun book and i think that you add in here too is that you know schedule fun schedule fun until you know if you know you're and this is the this is a woman's class but they're like if you know you're going to have you know, if you know you're going to go to a dentist and you hate doing that then you know get an hour massage after you know <laughs> whatever it is but the the concept is still the same if you have a horrible day, you know, plan like go to the toga party or whatever, you know, like make yeah. sure that you plan for fun afterwards as a, as a balance. Um, so anyways, those are my favorite tips from um, your part one. It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.